we tend to think that the world is very large and that we can do within it what we want and that biology and biophysics and the biosphere will continue to work as it has in the past, that it's large and substantially immune to disturbance. That is absolutely not true. It's being disturbed at the moment. The fact that the Earth is warming as a result of human activities is a really terrifying fact. We've clearly already seen that the Earth's climate is changing. And almost independent of what we do to limit greenhouse gas emissions, we will still see some additional climate change. So change has already occurred. Some further change is inevitable. What we need to do is to limit that further change. When you look at the change in temperature in the Canadian Arctic, of I expected five degrees Celsius. When you look at the changes in our rainfall patterns on the prairies of Canada, when you look at the changes that are expected also in the west coast in terms of snowpack and glacier retreat, it is perfectly clear that if we don't take part in a global process to slow the onset of indeed global warming, we are in essentially a suicidal position. Overall, the climate issue is the most serious environmental political and economic issue that I've dealt with in 30 years of public policy. It's not only fascinating, you know, it's very serious and in many ways it's very dangerous. We've never had six billion people in the world before using all the resources of the earth to their limits. And now we are diminishing those resources systematically by changing the global environment. People read every day in the paper about some aspect of this, whether it's a coral incident or a dead zones in the oceans or melting ice and no habitat for polar bears in certain areas. And it comes in in little packets. And what we've got to do is what we didn't do with the terrorism threat and that is uh, connect the dots. We're beginning to see evidence of uh, thinning of sea ice, of diminishing of the ice caps on mountaintops, and other evidence accumulating that the signal of human-caused climate change is beginning to emerge from the, the noise of natural variation in our weather patterns. Things are going to continue to worsen as far as climate change is concerned. The question is how much damage is going to be done before we start getting action on the part of the United States government. I've said many times it's the single most complicated and single most fascinating issue I think facing the world. It touches everything. And uh, you know, you can't be a serious student of the future of the world. You can't be seriously thinking about how nations get together. You can't seriously think about the survival of biodiversity on the globe. You can't seriously look at just about anything without factoring in issues related to climate change. Even though we work on this problem all the time, you've got to go back to ground zero and really start explaining the basics of the issue. Because if you don't get the basics, then you don't know what to do about it. And in this particular problem, it's a question of understanding that there is a blanket of gases that surrounds the Earth. And when the composition of that blanket is just right, we keep the temperature of the Earth just right. Uh, however, if we increase the gases in that blanket, then we're going to heat up the Earth. And the principal gas that we're concerned about is carbon dioxide. And since Americans and the rest of the world uh, became industrialized in the 1800s and, and thereafter, uh, we started burning fossil fuels, coal, gasoline, oil, uh, and other fossil fuels, either to heat our homes, uh, to provide electricity and power plants, or gasoline in our cars and SUVs to get around. And as we burn those fossil fuels, they give off carbon, and carbon combines with oxygen, and you get carbon dioxide. A carbon molecule, a CO2 molecule that we release from a tailpipe today, stays in the atmosphere for 100 years. Um, so the, the, the climate changes we're seeing now are a consequence, in large part, of the emissions that were made in the 50s and 1960s. Our emissions today are driving the kinds of changes that we will see uh, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years to come. And so we are now increasing the carbon dioxide in this blanket of gases surrounding the Earth. We've increased it by about 30% over its natural levels. And the more we do that, the warmer it's going to get. We have already perturbed the climate system beyond the envelope of natural variability. And we know this from measurements of carbon dioxide. 
we can measure carbon dioxide content in ice cores down in Antarctica, and there are records now that go back 400,000 years, and we know what the natural range of variability is in, in the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And we are outside of that limit today. So this is our freezer. This is where we keep all the ancient ice cores. It's very important to keep it cold, so we have a temperature monitor that just goes all the time, uh, making sure that the cores never get warm. If they get warm, the gases that are trapped in the cores tend to leak out. So now let's go into the freezer here. So this is an ice core. This is what they look like. You can see it's just a, a nice cylinder of ice. And the, the, the amazing thing about these is that they have annual layers in them usually about an inch thick. Each layer represents one year of snow deposition. So when you take a core like this through thousands and thousands of years of climate, you know what the temperature was doing every single year for this whole time. There's samples of the ancient atmosphere trapped in bubbles in the ice. And it's, it's these bubbles that allow us to know how much carbon dioxide there was in the atmosphere in the past, for example. And um, to ask questions like, uh, did carbon dioxide and temperature change at the same time in the past? How important is carbon dioxide to changing climate? And all of these things. And the, the, the answer to those questions is basically, yes, carbon dioxide does change when climate changes, and carbon dioxide is important uh, for the Earth's climate. A slightly warmer global average temperature is not likely to take out any species to affect maybe one human life. But that's simply the shorthand for climate disruption, or as people are increasingly saying, climate shock. This is not something benign, because it won't come just gradually as a tenth of a degree warmer this year than last year. As we know, it comes in a pattern which can be very disruptive. We also know that the, the more we provoke the climate system, the more rapidly we send these heat trapping gases to the atmosphere, the greater the possibility uh, that, that some regions of the world will see some rather abrupt cooling. Not so abrupt as depicted in the day after tomorrow, but perhaps on the order of what we've seen in the record of something on the order of a decade, which is quite rapid. Ice and snow will cover the entire northern hemisphere. The ice and snow will reflect sunlight the Earth's atmosphere will restabilize, but with an average temperature close to that of the last ice age. People think that global warming means that everything is going to get warmer, which would be logical since that's what the words mean. But it actually, a, a, probably a better term to use to describe what's happening in our, in our world is climate change. Because as the average global temperatures go up and as we add CO2 to the atmosphere, some places are going to get warmer, some places are going to get cooler. What scientists sort of agree on is that you're going to see more extremes more drought, more desertification in some places, uh, wetter, heavier rainfall in other places. These little bubbles here um, are trapped pieces of air um, that are 10,000 years old. So these little tiny pieces of air uh, represent you know, what uh, our ancestors were breathing. We, we know from these bubbles that uh, atmospheric methane concentration shot up at the end of the last ice age. And what we think that means is that the, the, the planet got much wetter in some places and drier in other places. And then 8,000 years ago, the methane dropped at the same time that Greenland cooled, all within 10 years of each other. And uh, what this means is that a lot of the, the world dried out. And so that, if that were to happen again today, there'd be widespread drought. That's really the most likely way that we humans will feel a climate event like this. It's not through a tidal wave hitting New York City, or certainly, certainly not ice in New York City, but more likely through drought and in some places and, and flooding in other places. But it is true we're seeing also, for example, uh, more intense rainfall. So that when it rains, more water is coming down. And that is a perfectly logical consequence of putting more heat into our system, into our climate system. More heat means more energy means more evaporation of water off the land, and that water goes up, it has to come down, and you get more of it in rainfall. Uh, so that we're seeing increased intensity of rainfall, not necessarily more, it's not necessarily raining more often, but when it rains, it rains harder. 
Uh, so when we see the floods in the Midwest that we've seen in the last decade or so, that again is another sort of harbinger of what's going to happen in the future. Changing the temperature of the Earth changes all climates. It warms the centers of the continents, for instance, which, when warmed, dry out. And we're watching at the moment the drying out of Central Asia. We have a big drought in Arizona, elsewhere, and everyone has noticed that the forests of North America are burning. They're burning because it's warmer and drier. We had 255,000 hectares of fires last year, but they were the most intense fires that British Columbia has seen, and when they took off, there was nothing anyone could do to stop them. We lost 300 and some homes, we lost businesses, we had an entire town, the town of Lewis Creek, wiped out. We had to evacuate rather 50,000 people, which is the second largest evacuation in the history of Canada. The same thing is happening all across Asia. I'm told that 13 million hectares of forests in Russia burned this past summer. These are big, serious problems. The climatic disruption has the potential for literally burning civilization off the earth in the course of the next decades. Where rain falls and where it doesn't has tremendous impact on civilization. Uh, the present intensification of droughts and floods uh, will pose tremendous problems for society. In the Okanagan area where we had the worst of these fires, we had a large sudden rainfall. It was a one in 80 year rainfall following this, this one in a hundred year drought. The rains caused flash floods. We had mudslides going through the community. People who thought they'd seen hell saw worse. And so the consequences of this, uh, these climatic extremes, these climatic anomalies of extreme dryness, of warm winters, are devastating our ecosystems and they're destroying our soil and the siltation is destroying the salmon streams in the area. Everything in the world is so interconnected that if you go grab one piece of it and pull it out or do something to it, you can bet there will be repercussions that we don't even know now. I mean, sure, the salmon might cease to exist in 50 years in the Pacific Northwest, but all the ramifications of that. Well, look, who would have thought that if you melt the snow a month earlier in the western United States, that that would lead to, you know, virtually fatal water problems? You wouldn't have thought that if I just told you that. You would never guess that. But the system is set up in such a way as to make use of that. The worst mistake we can make is to assume that the future will be as it has been. The snow is melting. The ice is melting. People in California, Oregon, Washington that depend on the snowpack in the Cascades, in the Sierras, in the middle of this century, unless we begin to act today, they're going to see that snowpack disappearing and their water supply and their energy supplies declining dramatically. The bottom line is that the greenhouse warming will cause changes in the water cycle in such a way as to put serious stress on the western United States as we know it within 25 to 50 years. And the stress will show up as just simply lack of water. It's uh, appearing now in the form of forest fires and drought and various other changes, spread of disease, plant diseases as well as animal diseases. We've got uh, for instance, winters where we no longer have 40 degrees below. And as a consequence, we haven't had that for the past eight years. As a consequence, the pine bark beetle, whose population is normally succumbing, about 80% of the population succumbs to the extreme cold. That population has gone into a super population and it is, uh, at this stage, infested 4 million hectares. That's 10 million acres of pine which are dead or dying, and uh, the population is in such a state, even if we had a cold winter, like we typically have, the remaining, we're at even only 5%, would still keep spreading, there'd be more beetles than we have pine left, and we expect all of the pine in British Columbia to be destroyed by the beetle over the next few years.